Chapter covers Chapter 10, Emotion and Motivation. What are emotions? The terms emotion, feeling, and mood are often used interchangeably in everyday language, but psychologists distinguish between them. An emotion is an immediate, specific negative or positive response to environmental events or internal thoughts. For psychologists, emotion, sometimes called affect, has three components. A physiological process, for example, the heart beating fast and sweating. A behavioral response, for example, the eyes and mouth opening wide. And a feeling that is based on cognitive appraisal of the situation and interpretation of bodily states. For example, I'm scared. Mood is a diffuse, long-lasting emotional state that does not have an identifiable object or trigger. Rather than interrupting what is happening, they influence thought and behavior. Emotions vary in valence and arousal. <clears throat> there are primary emotions. These are emotions that are innate, evolutionarily adaptive, and universal in that they are shared across cultures, and they include anger, fear, sadness, disgust, happiness, surprise, and contempt. There are also secondary emotions, which are blends of primary emotions, and they include remorse, guilt, submission, shame, love, bitterness, and jealousy. The circumplex model is another system for classifying emotions. It places emotions on a graph. Emotions are plotted along two continuums, or axes. First is valence, and this is how negative or positive emotions can be. <clears throat> the other axis is arousal. How arousing emotions are describes physiological activations such as increased brain activity or increased autonomic responses such as increased heart rate, sweating, or muscle tension. Here's a graph of that circumplex model that shows how these emotions work and where they fly on the graph. Emotions have a physiological component. Emotions involve activation of the autonomic nervous system to prepare the body to meet environmental challenges. Researchers asked people from various cultures to use a computer program to color which areas of the body were involved in feeling various emotions. Here's the result of, of that data. These maps represent areas of the body that are more active, warm colors, or less active, cool colors, when people consider how various emotions make them feel. The color bar reflects the extent of increasing or decreasing activity. The limbic system. In 1937, a neuroanatomist, Papez, proposed that many subcortical brain regions are involved in emotion. The physician and neuroscientist, McLean, expanded this list of regions and called it the limbic system. We now know that many brain structures outside the limbic system are involved in emotion and that many limbic structures are not central to emotion. The hippocampus is importantly, important mostly for memory and the hypothalamus is important mostly for motivation. For understanding emotion, the most important limbic system structures are the insula and the amygdala. The insula receives and integrates somatosensory signals from the entire body. Imaging studies have found that the insula is particularly active when people experience disgust. The insula is also activated in a variety of other emotions including anger, guilt, and anxiety. The amygdala processes the emotional significance of stimuli and it generates immediate emotional and behavioral reactions. Here's a cutaway of the brain. I think it's cut from the side, so you'd be looking at it from the front. It shows where the amygdala and insula are located. People with damage to the amygdala do not develop conditioned fear responses to objects associated with danger. Information reaches the amygdala along two separate pathways. The fast path by which sensory information travels quickly through the thalamus directly to the amygdala for priority processing, and the slow path, 
by which sensory material travels from the thalamus to the cortex, the visual or auditory, where the information is scrutinized in greater depth before it is passed along to the amygdala. This graph here will show you that information, organizes a little bit for you. The amygdala and cognition. Brain imaging studies have shown that emotional states are likely to increase activity in the amygdala, and that increased activity is likely to improve long-term memory for the event. The amygdala is also involved in the perception of social stimuli, such as when we decipher the emotional meanings of other people's facial expressions, for example, their trustworthiness. Those with damage to the amygdala often have difficulty evaluating the intensity of fearful faces. Which of these people would you trust? Most people would say that the person on the left looks trustworthy and the person on the right looks untrustworthy. Viewing the untrustworthy face leads to greater amygdala activity. And people with certain brain injuries cannot detect how trustworthy people are from facial expressions such as these. Are lie detector tests valid? As long as there have been lies, people have tried to develop methods for detecting such deception. A polygraph is an electronic instrument that assesses the body's physiological responses to questions. It records numerous aspects of arousal, such as breathing rate and heart rate. The use of polygraphs is highly controversial, though. Most courts do not allow polygraph results as evidence, and they are banned in the private sector. Yet they continue to be used by criminal investigators and in federal agencies such as the FBI and CIA. How valid are polygraphs as lie detectors? The goal of polygraphy is to determine a person's level of emotionality, as indicated by autonomic arousal, when confronted with certain information. Lying is stressful for most people, so autonomic arousal should be higher when people are lying than when they are telling the truth. No absolute measure of autonomic arousal can indicate the presence or absence of a lie, because each person's level of autonomic arousal is different. Here a person is hooked up to a polygraph apparatus measuring heart rate, respiration, and skin conductance from sweating. The differences between the physiological responses to the control questions and physiological responses to the critical questions is the measure used to determine whether the person is lying by comparing those differences. A polygraph measures autonomic systems such as heart rate, respiration, and skin conductance from sweating. Differences in autonomic reactions to critical questions compared to control questions indicate that arousal. That arousal in turn may indicate nervousness as a result of lying. However, the arousal may instead be due to general nervousness and thus may falsely indicate that a person is lying. There are numerous problems with using polygraphs to uncover deception. One serious drawback is that innocent people are often falsely classified as being deceptive. Most people who fail the test are actually telling the truth and are simply anxious about taking the test. The polygraph cannot tell whether a response is due to lying, nervousness, or anything else arousing. Lie detector tests are pretty easy to pass if you use countermeasures, such as counting backward by sevens or pressing your feet to the floor during critical questions. <clears throat> Perhaps the most serious problem with lie detector tests is that the investigator has to make a subjective ju judgment as to whether the pattern of arousal indicates deception. This judgment is often influenced by the investigator's beliefs about whether the person is guilty. This type of confirmation bias has also been found in laboratory studies, especially when the polygraphy results are ambiguous. Confirmation bias is a problem throughout forensic assessments, particularly when individuals develop tunnel vision and fixate on a particular suspect, ignoring or discounting evidence that is contrary. Researchers are seeking new strategies to uncover deception. For instance, numerous studies using EEG and fMRI 
have detected differences in brain activity when people are lying and when they are telling the truth. Whether the activation of various brain regions indicates genuine deception or simply reflects other cognitive processes is currently unknown. A team of neuroscience experts highlighted several methodological problems with fMRI research to detect deception. These experts raised additional ethical issues such as privacy that need further consideration before fMRI is ready for the courtroom. There are three major theories of emotion, the James Lang theory, the Cannon Bard theory, and the Schachter Singer two-factor theory, and we'll cover each of these in detail. In 1884, a psychologist, James, asserted that a person's interpretation of the physical changes in a situation leads that person to feel an emotion. A similar theory was independently proposed by the physician and psychologist Carl Lang. The James Lang theory of emotion. People perceive specific patterns of bodily responses, and as a result of that perception, they feel emotion. <clears throat> Here's a diagram to make that make a little bit more sense. According to the common sense view of emotion, an experience, such as seeing a grizzly bear, may produce an emotion and then a bodily response. According to the James Lang theory, bodily perception comes before the feeling of emotion. For example, when a grizzly bear threatens you, you begin to sweat, experience a pounding heart, and run if you can. These responses generate in you the emotion of fear. One implication of the counterintuitive James Lang theory is that if you mold your facial muscles to mimic an emotional state, you activate the associated emotion. Facial expressions trigger the experience of emotions, not the other way around. This idea is the facial feedback hypothesis. In other words, putting on a smile can trigger a happy response. In the next theory, Cannon and Baird proposed that the mind and body experience emotions independently. The mind is quick to experience emotions, and the body is much slower, taking at least a second or two to respond. In this theory, Information about emotional stimuli is sent simultaneously to the cortex and the body and results in emotional experience and bodily reactions, respectively. As a result, we experience two separate things at roughly the same time, an emotion and a physical reaction. According to this theory, emotion and physical reactions happen independently but at the same time. For example, when the grizzly bear threatens you, you simultaneously feel afraid, begin to sweat, experience a pounding heart, and run if you can. The social psychologists Schachter and Singer saw some merit in both theories and proposed a two-factor theory. The two-factor theory is a label applied to physiological arousal that results in the experience of an emotion. If something that causes arousal results in fear, then that is the label. When people misidentify the source of their arousal, it is called misattribution of arousal. Excitation transfer is a similar form of misattribution when residual psychological arousal caused by one event is transferred to a new stimulus. According to this theory, a person experiences physiological changes and applies a cognitive label to explain those changes. For example, when a grizzly bear threatens you, you begin to sweat, experience a pounding heart, and run if you can. You then label those bodily actions as responses to the bear. As a result, you know you're experiencing fear. Also, just as a PSA, don't run from bears. That will make them chase you. I believe the advice is to make yourself as large as possible and scream and make lots of noise and they will run away. Don't run from bears. <laughs> All right, men who walked across this narrow and scary bridge over the Capilano River displayed more attraction to the female exper experimenter on the bridge than did men who walked across the safer bridge. That would be an example of the excitation transfer. How can you control your emotions? <clears throat> emotions can be disruptive and troublesome. Negative feelings can pre prevent people from behaving as they would like to, but so can positive feelings. Our actions can be disrupted by negative feelings such as nervousness, 
or positive feelings such as being distracted by looking forward to an exciting upcoming event. Psychologist named Gross outlined various strategies people use to regulate their emotions. What not to do. Two common strategies, thought suppression and rumination do not work. With thought suppression, people attempt to not feel or respond to the emotion at all. Rumination involves thinking about, elaborating on, and focusing on undesired thoughts or feelings. Research shows that the following strategies are more successful. Control the location. Avoid the situation that causes the emotion. Change the meaning. For example, if you're watching a scary movie, just remind yourself that it's just a scary movie and not real. You could also find humor or distract yourself. Darwin argued that expressive aspects of emotion are adaptive because they communicate how we are feeling. Facial expressions provide many clues about whether our behavior is pleasing to others or whether it is likely to make them reject, attack, or cheat us. Facial expressions, like emotions themselves, provide adaptive information. A psychologist named Dunlap demonstrated that the mouth is a better indicator of positive or negative affect than the eyes are. Researchers showed identical facial expressions in different contexts and found that the context profoundly altered how people interpreted the emotion. Here's an example. Research participants were shown images such as these and are asked to categorize them as depicting anger, fear, pride, sadness, disgust, surprise, or happiness. The photo on the left pairs a sad face with a sad posture. When the face appeared in this context, most participants categorized the expression as sad. In the photo on the right, it pairs the same sad face with a fearful posture. When the face appeared in this context, most participants categorized the expression incorrectly as fearful. Facial expressions across culture. Darwin argued that the face innately communicates emotions to others and that these communications are understandable by all people regardless of culture. Another scientist, Ekman, proposed that the meaning of each facial expression varies from one culture to another. Ekman and his colleagues tested this hypothesis in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Japan, and the United States. They found that Ekman's hypothesis was wrong, and Darwin was right. Research has found general support for cross-cultural agreement in identifying some facial expressions. Support is strongest for happiness and weakest for fear and disgust. Display rules. These are rules learned through socialization that dictate which emotions are suitable to given situations. Differences in display rules help explain cultural stereotypes. From culture to culture, display rules tend to be different for men and women. The emotions most closely associated with women are related to caregiving, nurturance, and interpersonal relationships. The emotions associated with men are related to dominance, defensiveness, and competitiveness. Emotions strengthen interpersonal relations. <clears throat> In interacting with others, we use emotional expressions as powerful nonverbal communications. Nonverbal displays of emotions signal inner states, moods, and needs. Theorists have reconsidered interpersonal emotions in view of humans' evolutionary need to belong to social groups. Survival was enhanced for those who lived in groups. Those who were expelled would have been less likely to survive and pass along their genes. The fundamental need to belong indicates that people will be sensitive to anything that might lead them to be kicked out of the group, and social emotions may reflect reactions to this possibility. Guilt strengthens social bonds. Guilt is a negative emotional state associated with anxiety, tension, and agitation. The typical guilt experience occurs when someone feels responsible for another person's negative, affective state. Although excessive feelings of guilt may have negative consequences, guilt is not entirely a negative. 
Baumeister and colleagues contend that guilt protects and strengthens interpersonal relationships in three ways. The first is feelings of guilt discourage people from doing things that would harm their relationships. The second is displays of guilt demonstrate that people care about their relationship partners, thereby affirming social bonds. And third, guilt is a tactic that can be used to manipulate others. Evidence indicates that socialization is more important than biology in determining specifically how children experience guilt. Parental warmth is associated with greater guilt in children, suggesting that feelings of guilt arise in healthy and happy relationships. Embarrassment and blushing acknowledge social awkwardness. A person is likely to feel embarrassed after violating a cultural norm, losing physical poise, being teased, or experiencing a threat to his or her self-image. Like guilt, embarrassment may reaffirm close relationships after wrongdoing. Recent theory and research suggests that blushing occurs when people believe others view them negatively and that blushing communicates a realization of interpersonal errors. This nonverbal apology is an appeasement that elicits forgiveness in others, thereby repairing and maintaining relationships. And that concludes part one of the lecture. Be sure to listen to part two of the lecture. It covers motivation.